talk to us about Donald Trump's foreign policy. And uh, he is truly an expert in uh, American foreign policy. Um, he's Professor of International Relations and Director of the U.S. Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science at the moment since 2003, and Associate Fellow at Chatham House and the Royal Institute of International Affairs uh, since he's come over to this side of the Atlantic. Um, before joining LSE, he was Professor of Government at the University of Texas in Austin, and he's also held visiting positions at Harvard, Princeton, uh, University of California, University of Chile, and uh, also Mexico City, and he was the Fulbright Distinguished Lecturer in American Foreign Policy in the Beijing uh, uh, Foreign Studies University. So uh, he's had a very wide and international spread. Uh, while maintaining, of course, his main field of interest, um, which are the field of international security and comparative foreign policy, and a special focus on American grand strategy and foreign policy. Uh, I think his current work is particularly in light of the intersection of international security and political economy. And uh, his, uh, his publications uh, include Politics and Strategy, Partisan Ambition and American Statecraft. And uh, his prize winning book, uh, Defining the National Interest, Conflict and Change in American Foreign Policy. Uh, the juxtaposition of the interest, his interest in uh, international security and political economy is of particular interest because uh, I think we've been reading and understanding for some time uh, the factor which is uh, very influential in this election, uh, that 70% of Americans are frustrated with the economy, which is an extraordinarily high figure as we were discussing, and uh, that uh, Washington is not working for these uh, um, Americans. Uh, so it is with uh, great anticipation that we uh, will hear your view, which is, as I say, extremely well informed. So you're very welcome, and please do take Thank you, thanks very much. Thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, so it's great to, to be here, and it, it's, it's great also to have a, a chance to um, play hooky from work for a day. Uh, and to reflect on um, the gift that keeps on giving to people in my line of work, Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, really, if you'd asked someone, uh, you know, a year ago, um, you know, whether IIEA would be bringing somebody in to give a talk on Donald Trump, you would have thought you were trapped some kind of presidential reality TV show, you know. This is not reality TV, man. The folks that do reality TV who produce it couldn't make this stuff up. Um, and it's not over by a country mile, as they say down in Texas. I can see you're panicked. Um, and I'm just starting. So my charge, right, is Donald Trump's uh, foreign policy. What? would it be if this really happens? What would it mean if it does? Um, you know, when I told the, the manager of the U.S. Center that I was uh, coming here at the LC, that I was coming here to give a talk on Trump, she quit, well, at least it'll be short. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, you know, I was coming through customs this morning. And uh, the customs agent, the woman says to me, well, why are you here? I said, well, I'm, I'm here to give a talk. I thought that would be good enough. She said, I'm what? <laughs> I said, Donald Trump. She said, you're kidding. <laughs> I said, are, you, are you for or against? So, you know, so I reassured her, you know, and uh, she let me through. So, <laughs> she, he actually said her parting shot was, you can go to the pub afterwards. <laughs> so, um, so, and so on this business about, you know, I mean, in a way, uh, the, my, the manager for the center, uh, her name is Stephanie, and, you know, she's right. I mean, it's short, and it could be short because he has an issue, like, you know, a lot of white papers about what the policy is. Um, I mean, he's, this is, um, 
you know, they don't have issues, very many issue papers on foreign policy or anything else for that matter. And, you know, they used to say that George W. Bush wasn't a details kind of guy. Um, now, Trump has an explanation for why he doesn't put out policy papers. Um, and and, and uh, he says it's a secret. Why tell your enemies what you're going to do in advance? He's really said this. That's bad strategy. Why tell him that? And he's got to tell But hey, what about your friends? Why keep them in the dark? Makes you wonder whether Mr. Trump thinks America has many friends. Um, you know, I know he's Vladimir, but um, <laughs> so in all seriousness, um, Trump does have something of a foreign policy. Strategy. If you rummage around in the toolbox of strategies that um, that academics like myself teach about, the one that Trump's foreign policy strategy comes closest to uh, is called retrenchment. Um, it's a time-honored strategy uh, that statesmen uh, throughout history have used. Sometimes. Uh, with success and sometimes mm, not so much. Um, and remember that last point because I'm going to return to it before I'm done. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about retrenchment, uh, retrenchment strategies, and then what Donald Trump's retrenchment might look like um, before kind of wrapping up by talking about what the, the downsides of a, an American retrenchment might be, um, both for the United States, but I think it's kind of the point here, internationally. Um, so retrenchment is basically like, a, it's a strategy that relies heavily on diplomacy to reduce or to lower the cost it's a cost, cost savings strategy. And a few decades ago, uh, a political scientist, a guy named uh, Harvard political scientist named Samuel Huntington, uh, you know Samuel Huntington of Clash of Civilizations, and many, many books, um, cataloged uh, in an article uh, that appeared in Foreign Affairs the many ways that leaders can retrench. They can, as Huntington pointed out, draw sharper distinctions between their country's vital and peripheral interests. They can use diplomacy to reduce threats and to pressure allies to increase their share of collective defense, collective security, to invest more of their own resources in military spending. They can look for ways to substitute cheaper forms of power uh, for more expensive ones or devise more efficient ways to get greater kind of strategic bang or output from the same resources. In short, retrenchment is a strategy that sees little virtue in expansive ends or expensive Many in my line of work think America should retrench. For those of you who read Foreign Affairs, John Mearsheimer and Steve Walt recently had a piece, uh, two issues ago, I guess, uh, and they call for Washington to adopt a smaller geopolitical footprint, in their words, to become a an offshore balancer rather than the world's busybody. Uh, my phrase, not theirs. Uh, and that's a classic example. What they lay out is a classic example of retrenchment. America, they say, is overcommitted. It is trying to do too many things in too many places, and that's a prescription for strategic failure. America, they argue, should pull back. 
Now, strange as it might seem, Americans are no strangers to retrenchment. Indeed, many presidents, you go back all the way to the founding, at different points in time, presidents have embraced strategies of retrenchment. Um, in the 1970s, Richard Nixon, his America, found itself in a strategic bind that is not all that different, really, than the one that faces America today. The need for international leadership was great, but America's political ability to provide it was weakened by war and then by economic troubles, by the great stagflation of the 1970s and the sense that Americans had that the country was losing ground internationally, economically, and that their kids' lives would not be as good as their own lives. Close the gap, Nixon tried to redefine the nation's interests. And many of you will remember that, right? Through the talk with Mexico, pressuring NATO's NATO allies to increase their defense budget, it was called, there was a term for it. Jawbone, jawbone with America's allies. Get them to pony up. Nixon used to say, hey, if you don't work with me, you'll have to work with those guys behind me in Congress. They'll get a better deal with me. Right? So he put, tried to put the screws to the Germans and to, to others, right? To do more. And finally, to pass some of the cost of containing Moscow onto China by forming a tacit alliance with Beijing. My enemy's enemy is my friend figured, and so he forged an alliance. This was part of retrenchment. The idea was to reduce the cost to the United States by getting others to pick up more of the tab, more of the burden of providing that public good called international security. So get the Chinese to put leverage in effect on the Russians, or to put that in other ways, to give the Russians something else to think about besides the fold the gap, right? And kind of, you know, NATO. And just as an aside, it worked because the Russians moved about one third of their forces from the Western military districts to the Eastern military districts. Because they didn't, the Chinese and the Soviets, they didn't get along too well. They were shooting at each other across the Usuri River. Anyway, so that was, you know, what Nixon did was he tried to adjust and to retrench, to bring ends and means back into balance, to bring American foreign policy, what the United States was trying to do abroad, back into sync with what Americans were prepared to support. And his efforts, well, they were partly successful. One key reason that his strategy never reached its full potential was his pension for secrecy and executive discretion. It meant that his foreign policies never gained enough domestic legitimacy to withstand the inevitable second guessing from his many critics. <clears throat> Time when presidents, including Obama, are relying increasingly on executive orders to conduct their foreign policy, Nixon's experience is worth bearing in mind. But relying on strategic and diplomatic steps to engineer a retrenchment in today's world faces other problems too. I'm getting to Trump. For one thing, any effort by any president to engineer a Nixon-style retrenchment is unlikely to work. It will stoke fears of abandonment among America's allies, especially in Asia. 
In Nixon's day, there was no rising China to contend with. Should Washington try to cut costs by striking some kind of grand bargain with Beijing over, say, Taiwan sovereignty, it will only fuel doubts in Japan, South Korea, about the credibility of U.S. commitments. And meanwhile, attacking the problem from the international side alone will not cure the kind of populist furor that is bubbling up from below in the United States, which in a very roundabout way brings us to Donald Trump. Like Nixon, Trump, worried to become president, would pursue a retention strategy. Part of this has to do with Trump's own worldview. Believe it or not, for all the stuff that he seems to say on the spur of the moment, there are some things that he has been saying consistently for about three decades, especially when it comes to foreign policy. There's a great piece uh, by Tom Wright in, uh, was at the Brookings Institution and it appeared, I think, in Brookings, I think another version of it appeared in the Atlantic uh, maybe four or five months back about Trump's world. And I really, I mean, you know, I recommend it. It's, it's very well done. And, um, you know, uh, as, as, as he says, boy, we haven't seen this kind of stuff since the 19th century. You know, some of the positions that Trump said. But the key thing about the piece is he catalogs in, in real uh, detail, the consistency in Trump's positions going back to 1987. Trump, uh, you may or may not know, has had an interest in being president of the United States for a very long time. And occasionally, he's taken a pass at it, like, you know, kind of, uh, geez, I could do a better job than that, you know, you know uh, that, that bozo. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and has kind of tested the waters through interviews and so forth. And so there's a kind of a record, and that in addition to the various interviews that he, you know, did in those kind of important academic journals like Playboy. Um, you know, so he's, he's um, uh, so there's a, there is a track record in a sense um, to, to draw on. And one of those things that been rather consistent about. There's been real consistency over time. Is his view that America spends way too much time putting other countries' interests first. It's time, as he likes to say, to put America first. Now, if you're if you've forgotten your history, that's a catchy phrase, but if you're it's the same phrase that American isolationists used in the 1930s before Hitler attacked Poland and uh, many even afterwards. Trump has echoed these very sentiments really for over, for over two decades at any rate. Um, he thinks that other parts of the world are taking advantage of America and that the number one guilty party, you guessed it, it's Europe. In his eyes, the transatlantic alliance is a one-way street, with Europe free riding on the United States. Now, he hasn't said that Trump, in the Trump presidency, the United States would pull out of NATO. On the other hand, he hasn't said it would stay in either. Uh, if, if stingy allies are a problem for Trump, and they are, so are big trade packs like TPP and TTIP. Trump sees those as giveaways, or as he likes to put it, bad deals. His view of torture, good. 
Nuclear proliferation? Tolerable. Democracy promotion? Bad. Or just as clear cut? He's got pretty unequivocal positions on these things. They're clear cut. They may not be reassuring, but they're clear cut. Um, his view of America's commitments overseas, um, those are the ones, I think, these are the ones to keep your eyes on. The idea that America can renege or at least renegotiate its commitments without any cost. True, he's willing to spend more money on defense, but there's a catch. America's defense. He's not talking about forward defense. He's talking about fortress defense. Big difference. Forward defense is what America has preached and followed since World War II. Fortress Now, whether Donald Trump would actually implement these policies, well, that's unclear. I don't know. Frankly, I don't think he knows. I don't think he's gotten that far, or at least in how he would implement these. But there are reasons to think that in the main, he would follow something along these lines pulling back where he could, and trying to renegotiate where he couldn't. In short, he would pursue a strategy of retrenchment. And much the way Nixon did, perhaps look for ways to get China to contain itself, and to try to get Russia, the Soviet Union, to certainly try to get allies to do more for collective defense. I think that may be the end to the cake. And in something of a reversal, entertain the idea of a tacit alliance with Moscow to pressure Beijing to make concessions to Washington. What makes me so confident that Trump would move in this direction, this general direction. The reasons, I think, have less to do with Trump personally than with the structure of the situation that he finds himself in, or that he would find himself on January 20th as Americans elected president. Indeed, the structural conditions facing the next president such that I'm willing to venture a bet here that even if Hillary Clinton wins in November, she'll follow a path that is not altogether different. Now, to be sure, Clinton's foreign policy would not be a carbon copy of Trump's. She doesn't share his view on torture. She doesn't share his view on nuclear proliferation. She doesn't share his view on promoting democracy. She is, after all, an avowed internationalist. Trump's not. But she would face some of the same basic pressures to trim America's international sales. And like Trump, is unlikely to be in a position to resist even if she wanted to. Now I'm going to match your interest. So there are two reasons for thinking this. Two reasons the next president is going to be looking for ways to scale back internationally. One is, is that Americans are no longer convinced that internationalist policies are in the country. Rightly or wrongly, they see cheap Chinese imports, illegal Mexican immigrants, 
And yes, free riding NATO allies as evidence, I put that in quotes, because um, I don't subscribe to this view, as evidence that international policies that once worked for America are no longer paying the same kind of economic dividends for the country or for individual American voters. Do all American voters believe this? No. Internationalism is still a powerful force in the United States. But do a sizable number and a growing number of Americans share these views? I think the answer to that is yes. And I think that's what this election cycle, one of the main things this election cycle has revealed is that this is gaining strength in the United States. Moreover, and importantly, they blame Washington for failing to get things right, internationally as well as domestically. Today, less than 20% of Americans say they trust the federal government to do the right thing. These voters are the ones who've been drawn to America, Trump's America's first nationalism, and, for that matter, to Bernie Sanders' Trump's agenda and Sanders' agenda appeal to voters convinced that Washington doesn't have the best interest at heart. And it's not too hard, I think, to see why many of them might wonder why their leaders are not insisting that wealthy democracies like Japan and Germany, why they don't put a larger share of their income towards collective defense. They don't bother themselves with the details about like Japan's constitution, right? Or why Congress has looked the other way as millions of factory workers have seen their jobs outsourced to China and other emerging economies. That's not hyperbole. That can be that has been demonstrated factually by very good. Many surely ask why the two parties cannot find common ground on a new immigration policy, given that immigration, the immigration status quo, does drive wages down and it strains social services, especially for those on the lowest rungs of the social economic ladder. Now, to be sure, this is not the first time in the United States that calls for burden sharing and managed trade and tighter immigration have found their way into a US presidential campaign. But these issues have never gained the kind of political traction with voters that they have in this electoral cycle, at least not in the modern period. Much of this has to do with the fact that many Americans have not benefited from the economic recovery, but it also reflects Americans' growing sense that the U.S. can afford internationally to scale back. That at a time when America does not face a strategic peer competitor, the risks doing less are relatively low and manageable. Internationally, the United States enjoys a great deal of what I like to call geopolitical slack or latitude. I mean, China should be watched, but it doesn't pose a Soviet-style threat to American interests. ISIS is an ongoing challenge but it too does not pose an existential challenge to American security. Obama echoed this view in his much discussed interview in the Atlantic Monthly last spring. And a recent Gallup poll bears him out. Americans are much more worried about the state of the economy than they are about foreign threats. Now that is not to say that uh, an attack American soil wouldn't get Americans' interest. 
I mean, yesterday with what happened in New York, you know, I mean, there's immediate speculation about what, you know, wh where is that coming from? Are terrorist groups are involved and so forth? And there's a spike, there'll be a spike of concern about terrorism if it's somehow connected to that, um, that, uh, you know, in the polls. But then that'll come down again and the economy will be the dominant concern as it has been for quite a long time in the US. So what will this mean for US foreign policy going forward? Well, this much I think is clear. Any president who wants to pursue an active internationalist agenda in 2017 will face stiffer political odds than his or her predecessor did. This is why I say that even if Hillary Clinton wins the presidency, she will be under pressure to trim America's sails. Would a Clinton retrenchment be better than a Trump one? Yes. And not just because it would be done with kind of like less toing and froing. Clinton would have the advantage at home as well as abroad of being perceived as something of a hawk on foreign policy. Personally, I think that's overdone, but perceptions matter in politics. Yet whether it's Trump or Clinton, I predict that the next president will be looking for ways to prioritize and to economize internationally. This will likely mean greater emphasis on core strategic interest for the United States, like protecting the maritime commons, and less on peripheral ones, like democracy promotion. It will likely mean more attention devoted to East Asia and less on the Middle East and greater emphasis on burden sharing and less on nation building. Now for those who see America's vast array of overseas commitments as excessive and unnecessary and downright dangerous, this will be welcome news. Better to get allies and friends to do more of the international heavy lifting by taking away their American security blanket and forcing them to fend for themselves. And there are many in the United States that take that view. And they're not all, you know, Trump supporters. There are a lot of, you know, highly educated people, right, that take this position. That the U.S. is engaged in a problem, it's a moral hazard problem. It is spending way too much time su supporting other countries. And it gets itself into trouble. Better to let them work out their own problems and find their own path forward. <clears throat> For those who worry, like myself, about the potential downside risks of a smaller American geopolitical footprint like regional instability in a place like Asia, how and where those commitments are redrawn will be of critical importance. So going forward or looking forward, what I anticipate from Washington is what we might call internationalism light. Internationalism, yes, but internationalism on the cheap. Would I feel better about having Hillary Clinton with her hand on the tiller? Yes. I don't know if Donald Trump is beyond repair as former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates put it over the weekend, but he doesn't inspire a great deal of confidence. Clinton has many shortcomings, but the last thing one would accuse her of is being mercurial. Volatility is just not in her nature, and it's not exactly what the United States re needs right now. I say all this because my view, in my view, the great challenge facing the next president is going to be finding ways of pursuing a more restrained, calculated, purposeful internationalism 
without fueling doubts about American credibility abroad. It's not easy to navigate that. And I suppose I should close by saying there's a bit of irony in this. After all, it was only a little over a decade ago that America's closest allies worried about the risks of being too closely aligned to a kind of hyperactive United States. In the next four years, we're likely to hear less about the risks of grand US designs and more likely to hear about the fears of American abandonment. And I'll stop it right there.